The Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, Nothing is permanent except change. When looking into the depths of time, this truth is self-evident. Goliaths and dwarves alike have never lasted. Hundreds of reasons dictate the extinction or proliferation of an organism. And typically, for one to thrive, one must go. As our species conquered the globe and settled into our new environments, many animals fell to extinction. To this day, animals go extinct due to our dominance. 477 different species have been lost since the year 1900. One of the most interesting of these recently lost animals was the thylacine. This animal was an amazing example of convergent evolution and truly a devastating loss. Today, me and my guest, Nature's Reality, will be talking in detail about this animal. He has a YouTube channel as well as an Instagram page. Do me a favor and go check him out. Link in the description. The thylacine appeared two million years ago during the early Pleistocene. However, its family had been around for much longer. It belonged to the family Thylacinidae. They are described as dog-like carnivorous marsupials. The family originated in the late Oligocene over 23 million years ago. So far, we have discovered 14 different species and 9 genera of thylacinids. The only species to survive until modern times was Thylacine cynocephalus. Early thylacinids were small at less than 10 kg or 22 pounds. They would have been limited to feeding on small animals or whatever else they could forage. They are thought to have been partly omnivorous. A trend towards the Miocene was an increasingly carnivorous diet. Due to this, they began to exhibit a dramatic increase in carnivorous dental traits as well as a larger body mass. Thylacinus potin and Thylacinus magiriani both approached the size of a wolf. However, these species would go extinct and by the late Pleistocene only Cynocephalus remained. They were widespread across Australia and New Guinea, yet never numerous. Perhaps the most fascinating thing about this animal is its convergence to canids. The untrained eye could easily say that these skulls belong to the same genera or even species. But the last time these animals had a common ancestor was in the Jurassic. That's right, these animals are separated by over 160 million years of evolution. We are much more related to that wolf than it is to that thylacine. This is an example of one of the most fascinating principles in evolutionary biology, convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when two organisms develop similar traits independently of each other. This can easily be seen in the shapes of different marine animals. The physics of water forces the evolution of a streamlined body to allow for more efficient locomotion. In most cases of convergence, the examples are not that crazy. Like sure it's cool that these marine animals are all relatively the same shape, but they are still much different. What's crazy about the thylacine is just how similar its skull is and even the rest of its body was similar to canids. Zoology students at Oxford had to identify a hundred zoological specimens as part of the final exam. Word soon got around that if ever a dog skull was given, it was safe to identify it as thylacinus on the grounds that anything as obvious as a dog skull had to be a catch. Then one year, the examiners double bluffed and put in a real dog skull. The easiest way to tell the difference is by the two prominent holes in the palate bone, which is a characteristic of marsupials. So even the trained eye finds it difficult to distinguish this animal from animals 160 million years apart. That's mind-blowing. It goes to show that evolution does not entertain. It simply makes things work in the best way possible. This is very important to understanding evolution. It's not some magical force. It is a natural facet of life. Life inherently is a product of evolution and evolution a product of the physical laws of the universe. Evolution is some pretty interesting stuff, but let's not forget that this is a video about the thylacine. Thylacine resembled a large, short-haired dog in life. It differed phenotypically from canids in a few distinguishable ways. Its tail was like that of a kangaroo. The vertebrae were fused, which resulted in a restriction of tail movement. 
They also had tiger-like stripes, thus the name Tasmanian tiger. Their fur featured 15 to 20 distinctive dark stripes across its back end. Its fur was dense but soft and they varied from light fawn to dark brown. Mature thylacine range from 100 to 130 centimeters or 39 to 51 inches long. Adults stood 60 centimeters or 24 inches at the shoulder. On average, they weighed 12 to 22 kilograms or 26 to 49 pounds. So on average, about the size of a coyote. Some specimens were heavier and could be up to 30 kilograms or 66 pounds. Males were bigger than females by around 6 kilograms or 13 pounds. Early scientific studies hypothesized it possessed an acute sense of smell which enabled it to track prey, but analysis of its brain structure revealed that its olfactory bulbs were not that well developed. It is likely to have relied mainly on sight and sound when hunting. Its jaws, just like canids, are efficient weapons and processors of food. Their jaws had 46 teeth. In comparison, coyotes have 42 and foxes have 48. They had large canines, sharp premolars, and tough molars. Their jaws were muscular, but studies show that thylacine's jaws were too weak to kill an animal as large as a sheep, despite many farmers reporting that they did kill their sheep. They were able to open their jaws to a whopping 80 degrees. This can be seen in footage we have from one in captivity from 1933. Female thylacine had a pouch with four teeth, but unlike many marsupials, the pouch opened to the rear of its body. Males had a scrotal pouch which they could withdraw their scrotal sac for protection. This is unique amongst Australian marsupials. Their footprints are easily distinguishable from other native or introduced animals. They have a very large rear pad and four obvious front pads, arranged in a nearly straight line. Their claws were non-retractable and like that of canids. The thylacine was noted as having a stiff and somewhat awkward gait, making it unable to run at high speed. It could also perform a bipedal hop in a similar fashion to the kangaroo, demonstrated at various times by captive specimens. It has been speculated that this was used as an accelerated form of motion when the animal became alarmed. The animal was also able to balance on its hind legs and stand upright for brief periods. Observers of the animal in the wild and in captivity noted that it would growl and hiss when agitated, often accompanied by a threat yawn. During hunting, it would emit a series of rapidly repeated guttural cough-like barks, probably for communication between the family pack members. It also had a long whining cry, probably for identification at distance and a low snuffling noise used for communication between family members. Some observers described it as having a strong and distinctive smell. Others described a faint, clean animal odor, and some no odor at all. It is possible that the thylacine, like its relative the Tasmanian devil, gave off an odor when agitated. Thylacine had, at one point in time, a rather vast range stretching from New Guinea through Australia and into Tasmania. Within Australia and New Guinea, thylacine likely preferred to inhabit wetlands, grasslands, and dry eucalyptus forests. The presence of thylacine in New Guinea and Australia has been indicated through cave art. This amazing cave art depicts what can only be thylacine. The existence of thylacine in mainland Australia was also made evident by a carcass found in an Australian cave during 1990. The carcass was carbon dated and found to be 3300 years old. These remains helped put a stop to the argument that thylacine only ever lived in Tasmania. Within Tasmania, thylacine preferred the woodlands, plains, and coastal regions. Unfortunately for thylacine, these lands were at the same time highly sought after by European settlers looking to raise livestock. The striped pattern of thylacine would have helped to provide them with substantial camouflage throughout the lands in which they inhabited. Thylacine had an average range anywhere between 40 and 80 kilometers, or 15 and 31 square miles. Amongst one another, thylacine seemed to have apparently been rather peaceful, as they were capable of keeping their respective home ranges without ever becoming territorial. Sadly, we truly know so little about how thylacine behaved in life. 
There are very few recorded observations of thylacine and of the observations made, the majority of them stemmed from people observing thylacine that were kept in captivity. These observations were also frequently made during the day, and thylacine was a nocturnal creature. So a lot of the conclusions that we come to when discussing the behavior of thylacine are really just assumptions we make based on what we know of their close living relative, the Tasmanian Devil. During the day, thylacine would retreat to the hills and the forests, resting in caves, logs, and hollow tree trunks. Upon nightfall, thylacine would leave the safety of their hideouts to go hunt. They are generally regarded as being very shy creatures, who, like many wild animals, did their best to avoid human contact. The diet and hunting style of thylacine is actually a rather controversial topic. While we know that thylacine were strictly carnivorous creatures, we are not too certain of what kind of predator they actually were. Some argue that thylacine were pursuit predators who would have cooperatively hunted in packs to take down large prey, while others argue that thylacine was an ambush predator which hunted small prey alone. It is the second argument that is most widely accepted and most likely to be the truth due to the fact that studies suggest that the bite force of the thylacine was rather weak and they would have not been able to kill large prey. Thylacine likely favored small game, most notably small marsupials, lizards, and ground-dwelling birds. They may have occasionally hunted more medium-sized prey such as wombats, patamelons, redneck wallabies, and an extinct species of Tasmanian emu. It is unfortunate that we don't even really know how they hunted, but now I'm going to pass the video over to Nature's Reality to talk about their extinction. In both New Guinea and mainland Australia, thylacine has been extinct for at least the past 2,000 years. For a very long time, dingoes were blamed entirely for the mainland extinction of thylacine. However, we now know that dingoes are not the sole reasoning behind why thylacine went extinct in the Australian mainland. There were essentially three primary factors that led to thylacine's extinction in mainland Australia. Firstly, extreme habitat loss, which came as a result of increasing human habitation within Australia. Secondly, Direct pressure from dingoes, who hunted the same kinds of prey as thylacine and had affected thylacine numbers since their arrival in the mainland over 3500 years ago. Dingoes were not impacted by thylacine the same way in which thylacine were impacted by them because dingoes have an omnivorous diet and were therefore capable of consuming a wider variety of prey, which is something that thylacine was incapable of doing due to the fact that they had a strictly carnivorous diet. And the last factor, which was a sudden but abrupt change in Australian climate. All of these factors are what, when combined together, led to the extinction of thylacine in the mainland of Australia. Tasmania is the last place on earth that thylacine are known to have inhabited. By the time the first European settlers arrived in Tasmania during the early 1800s, it is believed that there was a population of around 5,000 thylacine that remained on the island of Tasmania. These European settlers brought along with them livestock, which primarily consisted of sheep. These sheep were the settlers' livelihood, and so they cared about them a great deal. This was horrible news for the thylacine, as the settlers quickly developed a nasty hatred for thylacine, as they would be blamed for the settlers' livestock loss, which was a rather prevalent issue. Thylacine were easy for the settlers to blame because they were the only moderately large mammalian carnivore in all of Tasmania. They were also so easy to blame because they closely resembled canids, which were often the ones behind livestock loss throughout most of the world. It was generally an overall lack of understanding and misinformation that fueled the Tasmanians' public negative perception and demonization of thylacine. It was only a matter of time before the people of Tasmania acted upon how they felt and sought out their revenge on thylacine. Thylacine were seen as a pest that needed to be eradicated, and by 1830 the first bounty for thylacine had been put into place. Bounties were quickly awarded to bounty hunters and farmers alike, who took joy in eliminating what they perceived to be nothing more than a pest and threat to their livestock. Then in 1888, the Tasmanian government established their bounty for the thylacine, paying one pound for each adult thylacine and ten shillings for each juvenile thylacine. These bounty systems were highly efficient in killing the thylacine and lasted up until 1909. By 1909, 2,180 bounties had been awarded and it is likely that many more thylacine were actually killed as a result of these bounties, but a lot of them were just never claimed. 
It was in fact these devastating bounty systems that did play the biggest role in thylacine's extinction within Tasmania. And the worst part about this all has to be that thylacine was not responsible for the livestock loss that European settlers suffered within Tasmania. Large populations of feral dogs and overall poor livestock management was what was truly to blame. As the 1920s came about, thylacine continued to become increasingly rare and they were hardly ever spotted. Efforts were finally being put in place to try and save the thylacine but it was already too late. At this time, thylacine were still hated by the Tasmanian public and it was extremely hard to sway the people's perception of them. Not many people cared to protect them because they still believed that they were pests that needed to be eradicated. And it was in 1930 that the last known wild thylacine was shot and killed by a Tasmanian farmer. After the last known wild thylacine had been killed, even more efforts were put in place to protect the species, but these efforts were just no help, and the species as a whole was too far gone. Attempts to capture thylacine specimens in an effort to study them were also put into place, but these all turned out to be unsuccessful as no more thylacine were ever found. After 1930, all of the thylacine that we knew were still alive were living in captivity. Which lasted for about 6 years when in 1936 on September 7th at the Hobart Zoo in Tasmania, the last known captive thylacine died. His name was Benjamin. Benjamin had died a mere 2 months after thylacine had been granted protective status. Sightings of thylacine were sporadically reported as the years passed on, but nothing was ever conclusive, and the thylacine was officially declared extinct by the IUCN in 1986, 50 years after the last captive thylacine had died. Ultimately, the extinction of thylacine in Tasmania, like in the mainland, came as a result of a number of factors, many of which can be attributed to humans. Significant habitat loss as a result of human habitation, fierce competition with feral dogs, and the mass slaughter of thylacine by human settlers from the mid-1800s to early 1900s all forced the thylacine into extinction. Recent studies also suggest that there were other factors at play that led to the extinction of thylacine, factors that had been long at play before any of the other factors we have discussed had taken effect. These factors that I am referring to are disease and lack of genetic diversity. Basically, thylacine was already on the decline prior to human expansion within Tasmania and Australia, and we seemingly only accelerated the rate at which something that was inevitably going to happen, happened. But it is important to remember that although studies may suggest this, it does not mean that it was going to for sure happen, and it doesn't take away from the horrible way in which us humans forced the thylacine into extinction. It is important to recognize the mistakes we have made in the past and set ourselves up in a way that prevents us from making the same ignorant mistakes in the future. Nature is incredibly unpredictable in every aspect and we probably won't ever truly understand all that nature has to offer. Despite thylacine being declared extinct and there being so much evidence pointing towards the fact that they are extinct, people still cling on to the belief that they are out there. And while it is easy to poke fun at the people who still believe that thylacine is out there, I must admit that it is rather an intriguing topic. Reports of wild thylacine settings have persisted since the last wild thylacine was shot in 1930. It is more than possible that very small, isolated populations survived after the last confirmed wild thylacine was shot, but these populations would likely not have survived very long afterwards, and would have probably died out within the following decades. This did not stop people from making many intriguing claims, which ranged from people researchers hearing distinct thylacine vocalizations, finding footprints and even scat. There is even a report of a person who claimed to have shot, killed and identified a thylacine in the late 50s, however no photographic evidence or real scientific confirmation has ever been put forth. And the same thing goes for practically all of these claims, there's a lot of people claiming things but they're never putting forth any conclusive evidence. To this day, there are countless people who spend a great deal of time searching for thylacine and claiming that it is still out there. There are a lot of videos, especially on YouTube, of people claiming to have captured the thylacine on trail cam. However, most of the time it is nothing more than some other Australian or Tasmanian marsupial or a fox. And so, it's sad to say, but this belief that they are still out there is more so just wishful thinking. I personally would love for thylacine to still be out there. And I'm sure a lot of you do too, but we should be more focused on ensuring we do not make the same mistakes in the future with other species that we made with the thylacine. But 
We've really had a hard time letting go of thylacine, and there have been efforts to bring them back. In the early 2000s, a female specimen that had been preserved in alcohol for over 100 years was used in an attempt to bring back thylacine from extinction. Sadly, the DNA of this specimen was deemed to be too extensively damaged to be used for cloning and the project was cancelled. This is the closest we have ever come to bringing back thylacine and nothing really even happened. With our current technological capabilities, it is highly unlikely that we would be able to bring back thylacine from extinction through cloning. Because any DNA that we do have of thylacine is not viable enough for such cloning projects to yield any success. We can only really hope that our technology will one day be advanced enough to resurrect this marvelous and unique animal. An animal that we at one point in time played the biggest part in making extinct. Though the thylacine has lost the time, it was truly a fascinating animal. An amazing example of convergent evolution as well as a beautiful animal in its own right. Hopefully we can learn from our mistakes and not let any more animals go extinct. There are currently over 7,000 species considered critically endangered and 33 which are extinct in the wild. Fortunately, awareness has been increasing about this topic and a lot of conservation efforts are being done. Everyone say a big thanks to Nature's Reality for coming out of the show and do me a favor and go check them out. Link in the description. Also, this is not an official announcement, but I have created merch for this channel. It can be found in the store tab of my channel. I'm still working on some designs, so if you don't see anything you like, check back when I hit like 100k subs and I think I'll be posting more designs and actually officially announcing at that time. So anyways, thanks for the recent support. I got over 100k views on that last video in less than a week, so that's pretty awesome. I'm going to keep pumping out more videos and the next ancient human is coming in two or three weeks. We'll see what happens. Thanks guys. Bye.